from Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 46, recorded on August 28th, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's Substack column called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we're in Project 2025 versus the Public's Health Part 2, the FDA. So let's, re even though we did this already, Paul, let's briefly review what is Project 2025. So it's a conservative manifesto, which will be put in place should Donald Trump be elected on November the 5th. It's a plan for how uh, government agencies will function moving forward. And, and some of the aspects are impinge on health topics, which is what we covered last time, the CDC, and this time the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Could you tell us what's the role of the FDA in the United States? So the FDA um, either authorizes or licenses medical products, um, including vaccines and biologicals. Um, they then allow companies to sell that product. Um, often what then happens is recommending bodies, in the case of vaccines, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, will then recommend that product for a certain age group to be given a certain number of doses, et cetera. Um, that's the way it works. So the, the FDA approves or emergency use authorizes biologicals, but do they have enforcement uh, capabilities? Do they say you have to do this? No. That, 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 first of all, nobody says you have to do it. Um, for, for the most part, the so, so FDA is a um, licensing body. The CDC is a recommending body, but it's a recommending body. I mean, there's nothing. The CDC, for example, doesn't mandate vaccines. That occurs at the, the local or state level. And again, there are pop-offs to that as well. So no one is forced to be vaccinated. No one is forced to take a biological. All right. So now, uh, what are the claims that are made in uh, this 2025 document about uh, childhood vaccines? Right. So I'll, I'll read exactly what the FDA, um, the prescription is for the FDA in Project 2025. Quote, Thousands of Americans of faith and conscience wish to receive various childhood vaccinations for themselves and their families, but are not allowed to receive vaccines that are derived through or tested on aborted fetal cells. For example, the chickenpox, hepatitis, and MMR vaccines, which stands for measles, mumps, rubella, in the United States are all linked to abortion in this way. There are ethically derived alternatives abroad that have been used safely there for decades, but the FDA makes it exceedingly difficult for Americans to import them. All right, let's let's go through these claims uh, for uh, one by one. So, uh, hepatitis vaccines. Let's take that's easiest. Is this correct? Right. So I, I should probably take a little bit of a step back. So the the um, there were two um, elective abortions that were performed in the early 1960s. One in um, Sweden, which created a cell line called WI-38, which just stands for Ristar Institute 38. And the other was created um, in, in England, and it's, it's called MRC-5 cells, which just stands for Medical Research Council in England. So those two cell lines have been used to make uh, uh, several vaccines, which include the ones that, that we just read, hepatitis A, rubella and varicella, but we've been using those cell lines since the early 60s. So this is 60 years of those cell lines more than, uh, and for the, for the rubella vaccine, the first rubella vaccine came about in the late 60s. So we've been using those for a long time. So uh, in the report, the 2025 report, they claim that there are alternatives, but the FDA won't allow them to be imported. Is that a correct claim? Well, so there is no um, alternative to either the hepatitis A or varicella vaccines. The only vaccines that are available are those that are made using those that those kinds of cell lines, the MRC5 or WI38 cell lines. There are um, three rubella vaccines that are made in Japan, uh, two of which are made in rabbit kidney cells, one of which is made in rabbit, um, sorry, quail embryo fibroblast cells that are sold in Japan. Well, why can't we just import those and use them here? 
Right, so it doesn't work that way. Um, if you if, if we bring a vaccine into this country um, to be given to American children, we want to first make sure that it is safe and effective in American children. So we're only really talking about the rubella or German measles vaccine. Well, rubella has been eliminated from this country since 2005. So you're not going to do an efficacy study. You're not going to see whether it works to prevent rubella infection because there pretty much are no rubella infections. You can, however, do studies of safety and immunogenicity to see whether or not you're inducing an immune response that would likely be protective. But you have to do those studies. And the FDA then would have to license that product, which means that they not only license the product, but they license the building in which the product is made. They license the, um, the protocols which uh, are used to derive that product. Um, it's a pretty laborious process. It would be expensive. I suspect it would cost probably hundreds of millions of dollars, basically for a product which would be an exceedingly small uh, market product, which I think, frankly, would be uh, financially uh, virtually impossible for these countries. I'm sorry, for these companies. So do you think it would be a useful enterprise to reformulate the, the vaccines that are produced in MRC5s or WI38s in the U.S.? Just and, and if, you know, I know it would be costly, but would that be would that attract more people to those vaccines? Do we have any idea of the numbers? It, it would be a very small number of people. So, so what the company would have to do is essentially compete against itself. So let's say companies like Merck or GlaxoSmithKline would say, all right, we're not going to make the hepatitis A or rubella vaccines or varicella vaccines in using these one of these two uh, cell lines that were derived from elective abortions in the early 60s. We're going to derive a whole new vaccine. Well, that's a new vaccine. So it would have to be licensed as a new vaccine which would cost hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars for what would be a, at most a very, very small market pickup, if at all. It's just not financially viable. They're asking for something that's just not financially viable. Is it true that Americans of faith are not allowed to receive vaccines from aborted fetal cells? No, so so that, that's interesting. And th th this was brought up by a, um, a group that was very much interested in this issue. And they, they basically lobbied the, um, the Bontifical Academy of Life, which is the um, major policy-making body for the Catholic Church, back in the early 2000s. And, and the person who ruled on that was Joseph Ratzinger, who was head of the Pontifical Academy for Life at the time, ultimately became Pope Benedict XVI. But what he said in, in, in reaction to that question was this, in so much as is, it is necessary in order to avoid a serious risk, not only for one's own children, but also and perhaps more specifically for the health conditions of the population as a whole, especially for pregnant women, that essentially these vaccines Rubella vaccine, for example, can be given to children whose parents are Catholic. And so what, what Joseph Ratzinger was saying was what basically all religions say, which is that we value the health of the child, the health of the family, the health of the community above all. And although he made it very clear in that statement that he wishes that the uh, investigators that, that made those vaccines hadn't chosen those cells, um, it, that it was still okay to use them. And I think it's, it's also interesting how we came to use those cells. I mean, this was the early 1960s, and there was something that happened with the polio vaccines that scared people, which is that, that uh, Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin, when they grew their when Jonas Salk grew the polio vaccine in monkey kidney cells, so did Albert Sabin. And um, the monkeys that were used there were obtained usually from Singapore or the Philippines, and they were imported into the United States. They were held at a holding facility in South Carolina. So these were, were primary cells. In other words, the animals would be sacrificed, their kidneys would be taken, and those kidneys were then used to grow those two polio vaccines. Now, it was found um, by Mary ba by um, sorry, um, Mary, uh, no, I'm sorry, the uh, Bernice Eddy. It was found by Bernice Eddy in the late 1950s um, uh, that there was an agent, which she called an agent, that was causing uh, the, the cell, cells to, to be destroyed, that she um, ultimately identified, or it was ultimately identified actually by Marie Silliman in the early 1960s as a virus, and it was the 40th known virus uh, monkey of monkeys, so it was called simian virus 40 or SV40, and what scared people was shown that that virus could cause cancer in experimental animals. 
violence. And that frightened people that we had now been given uh, a, a potential uh, uh, cancer causing virus in these polio vaccines. Now the, the Jonas Salk's vaccine was inactivated with formaldehyde, which also inactivated SV40, but Albert Sabin's vaccine wasn't uh, treated with an inactivating agent. So children received uh, SV40 and, and was it causing cancer in children? It really, by the early 1960s, SV40 became one of the most studied mammalian viruses. But fortunately, studies done five years later, eight years later, 15 years later, 30 years later, showed that you were no at greater risk of getting cancer from those, uh, the, have, having received those vaccines than if you hadn't received those vaccines. But that sort of drove people to human cells for, for two reasons. One, because human cells are very good at growing human viruses. And two, um, human cells are being obtained in this case, in the case of an elective abortion from a, a sterile environment. So I think that that is what drove us to the use of those cells and they've served as well. And I, I certainly understand how someone who's, who's Catholic, for example, for whom um, um, an abortion is, is sin, I mean, a sin worthy of excommunication where you don't get to participate in the in sacraments of the church can, can sort of be repelled by that. But, um, it is it should be reassuring that at least a major policy making body of the Catholic Church have said it's okay to do this because this these vaccines save lives. There are other religious organizations in the world, of course, besides Roman Catholic. And I have any of them ever said we value the health of our followers? Not to my knowledge. But you're right. It's not. This is not just a phenomenon for uh, for the Catholic Church. There are other religious groups that, that question this. I mean, it would be nice if it was. This was easily done. It's just not, frankly, financially viable. The, the other thing, thing, the second thing that I had mentioned here was that the thinking that this is just easy to do. Let's just bring another vaccine into this country. The, the um, there is a mumps vaccine that we use in this country that was derived from the inventor's child whose name was Gerald Lynn Hellman. It's called the Gerald Lynn strain. Um, the strain that's used in Japan is different. They chose a different mumps vaccine, so-called Urabi strain. Um, and that is actually a, uh, has, a, it has a more serious side effect profile, including uh, viral or aseptic meningitis, as compared to the Gerald Lynn strain. So these vaccines aren't necessarily interchangeable. And you want to make sure that you test any vaccine made uh, or derived in another country to make sure that it's safe for America's children. So these are all real obstacles, and they are ignored in the 2025 report. And, and the issue is whether they willfully ignored them to make a point or they didn't know about them at all. It's hard to know which is correct. I mean, the you know, as, as I'm not saying anything new, that you know, the abortion issue was a very big issue for uh, the Republican Party, and this sort of spilled over in, into vaccines, and I think that's why that became part of Project 2025. I think they also depend on people not reading up and checking for themselves, right? But here you've put it all succinctly in a short blog post and now a video. So I hope people listen and read it. The last paragraph of your article is very good. Quote, the authors of Project 2025 have failed to show an understanding of how vaccines are made, tested, supervised, and licensed, nor have they provided a moral path forward for vaccines they consider to be immoral. And... I think that says it all, right? Yes, every choice, including a choice not to get a vaccine, is also a moral choice. All right, we'll put a link to uh, the the column in the show notes for this episode. We'll also be embedding the video at Substack as well, so you can read and watch. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. Mm -hmm.